Hello, this is Andrew, and welcome to lecture four of the Digital Games and Contemporary Youth Culture module. This one is on serious games, um, an area which is kind of probably most specific to the, um, you know, the nature of this course, really, and not as general as the previous lectures. And I hope you can see throughout that there's some enormous sort of um, really interesting and dynamic takes on this concept of serious games. And, you know, I, I want to give you a couple of examples of where uh, this might all be going, um, which is super exciting. Um, so what I'm going to do first is just give an, a, an overview of it. We look at some of the theory surrounding that, and then we get into a, a number of different types of examples um, of where this is all sort of manifesting. So firstly, I just want to look at, uh, to get a definition of what a serious game might be. Uh, I've just taken this one from Wikipedia, where it's basically in a, a game or an applied game designed for a purpose greater than entertainment. So that could be, it has uses in industries, be it defense, education, scientific exploration, health, emergency, city planning, engineering, politics, or what I'm going to kind of look at as well as different areas like, well, to take the scientific end further to research and uh, different models of um, getting research and to, of garnering research and also into um, advocacy and towards social justice and social change being a kind of a, a, a really interesting um, aspect of serious games and where they're going at the moment. So I just want to recap on where we started out really uh, just to underpin the concept of a serious game. I feel it's important to kind of understand that games have come from you know um, origins like the military usages of and it being a repurposing of a lot of these technologies that were um you know came from military budgets really that um allowed the video games industry to flourish and um, grow and kind of move more towards say more trivial fantasy based games or you know just something more sort of naive essentially from such um you know um kind of high stakes um industries and you know very kind of serious beginnings and perhaps we're looking at a kind of a, a counter swing back towards these sorts of uh you know aspects of society which are more serious now so it's um you know it's probably it, it's moving back in that direction so be it from the early versions of Pong uh, repurposing oscilloscopes or likewise with ARPANET and, um, you know, the origins of the internet um, being from a military base. It's quite interesting to kind of keep that in mind when we talk about games in particular and also to hold the, the term serious games. So the first sort of um, the most obvious um place that we would we would see serious games getting some sort of a foothold or another you know to be called a serious game be in a simulation environment where basically we have these uh, you know real world environments where all the 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 simulation of the environment and all the 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 um extensions of that mimic and mirror real world scenarios and uh, the consequences also mirror that. So we look at this like be a driving similar truck driving for a specific model of a truck, cars or airplane pilot in an airplane, where all the checks and balances have to be done. Anything done out of order, out of sequence, done um, inappropriately, or, you know, alerts that aren't being followed kind of have other consequences which would mirror that of a real world environment so you can see how as a, a training and a learning tool these are vital in a lot of respects but also um just to 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 give that full immersions where you know you could run through various emergency sorts of um, procedures that you wouldn't have the ability to do in real world environments the bottom one here is just, how, you know, there's simulation for everything now, like for this would be 
for managing, you know, an abattoir, abattoir and um, looking after and isolating pigs with developing diseases or, uh, you know, different types of feeds or contaminations of feed sources or whatever, something that applies to a real world industry like that. But there's pretty much a simulator, a simulation game for every sort of um, professional environment that would have an element of high stakes or uh, scenarios that couldn't be replicated in the real world as they'd be too costly or too dangerous. And this being kind of a vital part of a simulator that it, it allows the, the, the ability to um, give a person uh, in a, a train, a training and a, a level of learning and training in how to um, mitigate against emergencies or different sort of scenarios without them having to be costly or happen in the real world. This quote will um, emerge later on when we look at one of the videos, but I thought it was worthwhile sort of isolating because it's quite um, eloquent and really, you know, it explains quite a lot in a really simple way. But the best way to change the future is to play with it first. So we have this aspect of a simulation environment, which can allow from anything from brainstorming to scenario planning to um, you know, any, any version of just originating new um, processes, ways of thinking, uh, ways of working through certain sort of be it, um, puzzles or difficulties uh, in a play environment rather than them having to manifest in the real world. Um, we, when we talk about this in relation to the emerging theory around um, serious games, we look at a uh, we're going to look at two people now, um, Ian Bogost and Gonzalo Frasca, who have worked together um, both in originating theory and on games in particular, and have kind of similar but slightly different takes on what a serious game would be. So this, first we look at Frasca and then we look at Bogost. So Frasca, first we define what, what the word rhetoric means because this is something that's vital to both of the theories or in general, looking at serious games, this is kind of a... Um, the new sort of branch of the breaking off point, which separates game environments and serious game environments in particular from other sort of um, media technologies. So if we look at rhetoric being the art of persuasive thinking and uh, writing and speaking and uh, using these to articulate a point with a view of convincing a listener um, when it comes to computer games and, and gaming in general, we have um, a different type of rhetoric that is unique to that um, to that technology. So Frasco would look more at um, a simulation rhetoric, something which he would see steeped in, um, you know, tradi more traditional sources and scientific models or texts such as the I Ching, uh, where we'd have a pretty much a simulated environment where th there's parameters to this and how it's put together is interchangeable and can be at the um, discretion of the user or once a certain question is asked of it, it would return an answer. So Frasca would look at it along those more traditional lines of be it an, a narrative um, model of this being something set so a narrative applying to a past, a drama, to a present, which is the dynamic of the, the involving aspect of it and the simulation towards the, a, 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 a future or the potential of things to change, essentially. we we'll leave it at that. In terms of um, Bogost and Frasca, they both kind of delineate along the lines of politics, advertising and education being the kind of the, the vital signs of serious games at play, uh, both to the positive and the negative of that, which we'll, we'll address the negatives later on. I'll touch on it, like to say, with things like gamification in Bogus is quite sort of, opinion, has strong opinions about that being uh, something to emerge rather opportunistically from the advertising industry and advertising games and stuff like that. Likewise, with using spin and politics, there'd be an element of that. The Frasca's kind of current sort of, um, you know, work would point more to a really dynamic aspect of um, 
how serious games can be applied, mostly in education. I have a short video here which will which will see him kind of outline that, and I'll come back right after this. I'm Lauren Keating with Tech Times, and I'm here with um, Gonzalo Fresca. Thank you so much for talking to us today. And you had a really interesting discussion this morning on the opposite of boredom. What is the opposite of boredom? Well, the opposite of boredom is not, as you might expect, fun or entertainment. It's actually being challenged. And I think that uh, if we really want to improve our school system, we have not to entertain our kids, but to be more challenging and provide better game and play environments for them. I talk about two very important new apps. One is called Dragon Box Algebra, which is kind of magical because it teaches kids, very young kids, six, seven year old kids and forward to solve algebraic equations, which seems like a very hard thing to do, but it's a very elegant uh, piece of software. And then Earth uh, Primer, which is uh, an iOS app that was launched last week. And it's a book about the planet, but it's a book illustrated with simulations. And so you can create mountains and, and like uh, raise the sea level or volcanoes. It, it's amazing. And where do you see the future of education in terms of games and to either play or video games? Well, I, I'm a big, big, big fan of uh, the Quest to Learn uh, schools uh, here in New York City and in Chicago, where the, the whole curriculum is based on, on, on play. And they use video games, but not they're not playing video games all the time. They actually uh, also have in a lot of like play-like activities. And that, I think that's where we should be heading because the school system was designed for a world that doesn't exist anymore. And kids have to learn a lot of uh, skills that are not what the 20th century required them to. They get a, new problems and uh, they have to collaborate and figure them out together and face tougher and tougher problems, just like in video games. I mean, you defeat a monster and you want a harder one. If it's too hard, it's not fun. If it's too easy, it's not It's not fun. You have to find this middle ground, and that's exactly the same in education. Great. And you've been in this industry for over 30 years. Do you have any advice for um, those who are interested in becoming um, video game developers? Well, I mean, uh, first, try to find like-minded people and team up and experiment and, and there's never been a better time to, to learn about games. I mean, you can do it online. The global game jam that happens every January is awesome. There's game jams where people just, for a, during a weekend, they team up with strangers and create a game uh, over a couple of nights. Uh, that's a great way to go. And I think you have to find your own voice. I mean, yes, finding a job in the university could be a nice way to learn going to university, there's more and more uh, college programs, something I never dreamed of. I mean, when I, when I was starting here, I mean, it's like people getting a diploma. I, I now have a PhD in video games, so it's so weird. I never thought that it was going to be a possibility. Now it's becoming even normal. So uh, take risks, learn, have fun, and don't take for granted uh, the conventions. Video games are very, uh, very young still, and there's plenty of room for innovation. And going indie and learning from fellow indie developers, like here in Indicate East, it's probably one of the best places to start. Thank you so much. The times are certainly changing. This is Lauren Keating with Tech Time. Okay, so just pick up on a couple of quick points there from that. I let it run on a little bit longer just to just I hadn't discussed the. Um, you know, the, the significance of, say, the games jams and this sort of new fora that are emerging, not, you know, d dependent on a, a, a geography of being, you know, um, different ways of, different modes and ways of, of, of developing games and originate, originate new ideas for this, which I'll pick up on a little bit later when it comes to the, the research aspect and scientific research and games being used to that degree. Um, but we can see from the, the games he, he cited there of like those sorts of simulated environments of, you know, deceivingly naive games of um, or deceptively sophisticated games. I mean, such as the you're teaching algebra and logic models to like, 
really young children um in a game play environment and that can only come with with um with benefits and you know enormous significance and those new models of learning just being super dynamic and uh really you know boding well also it, it pointed to just quite how um you know out of step contemporary education is with these technologies and with these sorts of innovations and that's something which is um you know clearly has need in need of being addressed so when we move on to bogus talking about the um his uh, kind of reading of 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 serious games and it'd be more towards persuasive games so that persuasive element of the rhetoric which we discussed earlier of, of you know it just be the, the 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 procedural nature of games and the immersive nature and the rule based representations and in interactives all being things that point to um you know the potential for uh, new modes of representing or um things that can support existing cultural and, and social pos positions or disrupt them and um, potentially lead to longer term social changes. So we have an environment where this can all uh, occur. The difference here being, um, I'm going to run a video in a minute where he gets it, but I'll just flag it before and this concept of the, the, you know, games being one of the very few areas where complexity is um is craved because you know that it relates directly to the um the difficulty levels of a game and the more nuanced things are whatever makes that game and play environment unique and that's something which is kind of um contrary to pretty much every other mediated technology at the moment which is going towards the soundbite culture i gotta go to um a video Bogost has where he kind of expands on that sort of take on on serious games and persuasive games. Uh, the video is quite poor quality, so it's smaller, but the sound is perfect, so you should be able to hear it fine. This is ABC Fora. Good morning. It's it's great to be here. Thanks uh, for having me. So it seems to me that when we look at the issues that face us today in the world, we'd like things to be simple, wouldn't we? We'd like answers, preferably one answer, really, and preferably a succinct and decisive answer. Indeed, it seems to me that we're living amid a general trend to simplify and isolate ideas, questions, and problems as much as possible. In education, for example, we segregate subjects into neat little parts presented in simple ways to be learned by rote and reported back. On television, conversation is driven by short segments and sound bites. Media training encourages us to summarize, uh, to synopsize, to condense. Indeed, perhaps the newspaper's decline comes in part from a 30-year trend toward soft news and infotainment here we have the colorful USA Today. In particular, it's uh, been cited as the primary example of post-television news, or what some call Mick News. Ideas packaged and crayon-colored for appeal rather than for complexity. One might add to this list the blog, with its focus on immediacy and recentness and conciseness, where lists and top tens and scoops are the predominant way of communicating. Or perhaps even Twitter, whose 140 character constraint encourages us to soundbite the mundane as well as the remarkable in our lives. But things, of course, aren't simple. They're complicated. They're more complicated now than ever before. And the reason I'm interested in video games is related to this. They are, it seems to me, the one popular medium that embraces that complexity rather than shying away from it. And therein, there is a power that hasn't yet been fully exploited, but has begun to be done. So let me give you an example. And it's an example I discuss in uh, my book, Persuasive Games. And it's an example about a commercial game, uh, not a so serious game uh, called Animal Crossing. Has anyone played this game, just out of curiosity? Ah, oh, excellent, okay, only a couple. 
So Animal Crossing is a, a lovely game that's wonderful for kids because you start by running away from home. And you arrive in this, uh, this lovely idyllic little village filled with animals and you're the only human in the village. And of course, um, you didn't plan very well when you ran away. Uh, so you don't have anything uh, really with you, no money, uh, just a pack on your back. Uh, but, but fortunately, um, uh, Animal Crossing is equipped with a real estate tycoon of sorts uh, named Tom Nook. He's a raccoon and uh, offers you a little hut to move into. It's no trouble, he says. Uh, you can just work for me to, uh, to you know, make back the, uh, uh, the home that he's provided. Um, so, you know, you, you, you buy the game for uh, $50 at the store and you bring it home and excitedly put it into your Nintendo and uh, fire it up and, uh, and the first thing you do is get a mortgage. Now, you know, once you have your house, then there are many other activities you can take part in. You can visit with the other, uh, the other animals, and sometimes you have to do favors for them or, or, uh, or service uh, Tom Nook's demands as you work in his shop. You can, you can go fishing and uh, collect insects, and uh, you can sell those back to, uh, to the general store where you can use the proceeds to purchase things for your home. Certainly, we all like to customize our environment. And uh, in fact, Tom Nook also runs the, the general store, it turns out. Uh, or you can, you can buy things from him. He's kind of cornered the market in Animal Crossing. Uh, or you can, you can go and make your own, uh, your own uh, umbrella. Over time, uh, you know, maybe you've you've succeeded in uh, catching enough fish or doing enough favors that you begin to pay down that mortgage, and uh, you can you can go and make your own uh, your own uh, umbrellas or designs for shirts and uh, kind of customize the way that you look. And time passes in Animal Crossing; uh, it's uh, tied to your console clock. Uh, so as the seasons change or as the day changes to night, then those changes are reflected in the environment and. There's a kind of uh, idyllic uh, pastoral nature to the world. Now, um, over time, uh, you know, maybe you've, you've succeeded in uh, catching enough fish or doing enough favors that you begin to pay down that mortgage. And uh, uh, Tom Nook might offer that, uh, you know, perhaps you'd like to expand, maybe a, a second floor uh, or, or a basement. Uh, many options, certainly, to, uh, to facilitate your increased purchase of goods and services uh, from his store. So this is the only game that my entire family has really enjoyed playing. And uh, I remember one day I came home from work and my son, who was five at the time, uh, stopped me as I walked in the door and said, Dad, I've got a, I've got a problem. I really need to talk to you. And uh, I, was, I was quite excited. He was five, you know, so we hadn't had this sort of, sort of paternal experience very much. Um, and I wasn't sure what to expect. So, he, you know, he sat down and, and, and began talking to me and he said, I, I don't know what to do. I've got a problem. Okay, okay, son, tell me, uh, tell me about your problem. Um, well, you know, I've got so much stuff. I've got so much stuff. I can't even move around in in my house anymore. And now I know he's talking about Animal Crossing. You know, I've got that 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 pear couch and that that moon rock and all those shirts that I bought. Um, and, and the sort of the sort of space satellite that you gave me, and I, I just I don't even have any room to, to move around, to walk around. I need I need a bigger house. I need more space. So I said, okay, that's I, you know I, I understand. Um, so what do you think? So well, well you know the, the problem is that see I I spent all my money buying this stuff for my house. And so I can't pay down my, my mortgage so that I can get an expansion, so I can expand um, because I have all this debt from my, my first mortgage. And so what do I do? So it was my five-year-old who had, uh, thanks to Animal Crossing, fallen into the trap of long-term debt that uh, many of us have suffered under over the past couple of years. And uh, and you know obviously we use this as an opportunity to talk about uh, talk about these things and how they worked and, and eventually he had to make some decisions about whether he was going to sell some of the things back back to Tom Nook of course for the secondhand market um, and try to expand his house or, or maybe make do with less 
And what's interesting about this game is that it's it's clearly powerful in a in a in a really meaningful way. Even though it's just an entertainment game, a kind of cartoon looking trifle, it engages players in complex, nuanced ideas that have the potential, at least, to change them for the better. It's rather the opposite of conventional wisdom about games. To understand how a game like Animal Crossing can have the power it does, it's useful to think about the properties that are unique to games, what makes them different from other media. For me, those are these, the idea of modeling, of role play, and of world building. So let me talk about each of those in turn a bit. In games, players explore some model of an aspect of the world. And when we think about modeling, we usually kind of conceive of small versions of physical things, maybe planes or bridges, and we want to make kind of miniatures of them so we can test their properties and see how viable they are. But if we generalize the notion of the model, all it really means is a smaller abstracted version of a complex system. Models describe the logic by which things work. The flexibility of computation allows modeling to do much more than just creating tiny versions of full-size things. Computation makes it possible to model the behavior of almost anything, really, from the chemical process of brewing tea to the physical properties of a realistic environment to the dynamics of a political or social situation. In computing, in some related fields, we sometimes call this trait procedurality. Computers' ability to construct complex behaviors driven by many variables that a user can manipulate and explore. Computational models let us explore how things work. And video games are just a particular kind of computer model, but they're one oriented toward human experience and ideas much more so than other kinds of software. With video games, for example, one can model how civilizations expand or how aircraft fly and how aviation rules are managed, or the practices of Japanese feudal espionage, or how universities are run. This is, I know, the game that you're all going to be dying to play when you, when you get back home. Roles, then. In games, players take on roles, and they make decisions in those roles that are constrained by the model that the game presents. Now, it's true that the roles offered by many commercial video games usually involve the power fantasies of adolescent boys, that of the pro ball player or the space marine or the blood elf or whatever. But the role play video games afford is actually much broader than that. And we need to give the games credit for doing much more than, we give, we, we, than it may appear on the surface. In general, playing a role just means simulating some experience. Every, uh, every child knows this. But the difference between role play in the general sense and the kind of role play that we get when, we, when a, a software model is built around it is that the computer model of a video game allows the enforcement of the rules of that model's logic. It makes us play a role in accordance with some designed constraint rather than just a free-for-all. Okay, so, yeah, just to kind of, you know, step into some of those points there, which are quite interesting. Um, I suppose the key one, the animal, um, looking at the, 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 the Animal Crossing simulation game, and, you know, it's appearing somewhat novel and trivial there uh, when describing the, you know, his, his son's interaction with it, but it's quite a sophisticated thing that's happening there much the equivalence to the you know the learning algebraic equations at like such an enormously early age that frasca spoke of in the app earlier where you have this simulated modeled environment where someone can role play um a whole scenario there um to to get a full understanding of it without ever having to do it you know be it as a accruing uh, consumer spending and the debt the debt aspect of of society like that or likewise with you know just kind of acing complex mathematics from a very early age in a game environment so they're kind of two really you know um 
pointed sort of uh, aspects of serious games or pers persuasive games at play. The vital thing underpinning all this, which in Bogus has kind of spoken of there, but it, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's easy to miss it as well, but it's it, the, the whole idea that games, the video game environment being a computational model um, is, is off your free will, you know, something we would have discussed in the last lecture of, you have to play a game for it to reveal itself to you. So it's much the same way with a serious game that if it's, a learning environment you'll get out whatever you put in and you'll see the parameters of it very quickly and you can you know cross-reference them or check them or put it all together in that simulated environment in a much different way or a much revolving uh, uh, um, involving an expansive way you know so um yeah that's just a couple of points i really wanted to pick up on there we i just want to outline a few examples of um games which are kind of you know one thing is the aspiration of a, a serious game for so, for social change and um you know what can ascend, what can be achieved with that and the other is the the actual the confronting an issue directly and using that to impart news or you know a, a further understand a broader understanding of the issue or the elements of that or the parameters of a real world simulated environment of how these things come about. And then the other thing is how that's kind of understood and interpreted by a player or a, a, a user at the other end of that. So there's a few kind of quick examples here of different games, which I'll pick up again later. And I'm sure you might have heard of a few of them already from uh, the other aspects of the course. But games such as Darfur's Dying Unmanned and the unfinished game Escape from Woomera here. Um, Darfur's Dying is uh, a, 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 a kind of regarded as a, a, a flash-based browser game, but um, kind of a, a news game specifically rather than a serious game, which is um, about the crisis in Darfur in Western Sudan, where a player would take the role of any one of a number of uh, young people under the age of 30 who were sent on these who were sent on these runs to collect water in the face of like um all sorts of dangers from like opposition warring um militia and um yeah just the environment that that that, that all you know the real environment that all plays has played out in and presents it in a game form um <clears throat> So it's something that's kind of, you know, very advanced in terms of the, the, um, the potential of, of, of a game like that to mirror real breaking news events and to kind of give that side across of, um, you know, uh, how people in, in, in the face of a plight, uh, it, this being presented in a game environment rather than as we would have it as a reportage kind of envir environment or something more typical in news or other media forms. So Darfur's Dying is quite an interesting game to that degree that I'll pick up on again later on. On Man's another one just about the life of um, a drone pilot um, and kind of trying to build a psychological profile of someone who would do this type of work and you know the kind of the discordance of you know essentially murdering people uh remotely from a uh you know a, a operating drone and then just kind of operating drones and then having like you know a more everyday life and having that sort of removal from violence being a kind of a a really sophisticated thing for a game to try take on. Uh, Escape from Woomera again. I will discuss this later on because it's an unfinished game, but there's it's kind of a, a, a nice um, case study of how a game can achieve a social change. Uh, the game's even incomplete, which is another sort of level of intrigue on it. But it basically describing the um, the conditions that uh, people were living in and a refugee camp in Woomera in Australia. Um, so these are some examples of, um, you know, serious games kind of uh, 
presenting as a direct sort of activism, I suppose, or a news event opposite real unfurling events in the world, which is kind of, um, you know, a really interesting dynamic with that. So I'm going to show another one from um, a an earlier period from around 2007. This was a game about peak oil called World Without Oil. <clears throat> and um, what we'll see here is just that sort of taking that to the next step of the, the, the social change and the awareness around an issue, allowing um, people to partake in the game in multiples of ways really and just it could be quite a quite quite interesting how that sort of uh you know expands into having a direct effect on people who involve themselves in a game like this or play a game like this but also um has uh you know just how it how it changes the the, the 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 context of the arguments around this and also potentially presents new solutions as well as being a vital thing which i'll take up on uh, after this as well gas prices jumped to over four dollars a gallon There is a very much police state going on in the streets now. One way or the other, we're all in this together. This is our local farmer's market. Jing, this is Pete Prophet. Cal. of a global oil shock. A group of people have received notification that the shock is going to come on, but they do have a little bit of time to prepare. And what they prepare is the World Without Oil website at worldwithoutoil.org. And they want to collect the stories from everyone who's going through the oil shock. Uh, they want to hear what people are experiencing. And so they invite people to essentially write in. The goal of the game was to have normal people, ordinary citizens from all around the world, tell their story, what their life would be like in a world without oil. And by collecting all of these individual stories, we could paint a future landscape that would really use the collective wisdom of the people on the internet to think about the challenges we might face and some of the solutions we could use to solve an oil crisis. ITVS has been promoting innovative public television for over 16 years, and we wanted to take the next step to talk about new ways of telling stories. World Without Oil was an amazing project. It was innovative, it was smart, it promoted social issues, it hit all the marks of our mission, and plus it was a game. And on top of that, it was an alternate reality game. Alternate reality games are different from most computer games, from most video games. The most important thing about them is that it's not role play, it's real play. You're not playing a character, you don't have a little 3D avatar. In the game, you're yourself. And you talk about your own life and your own everyday circumstances, except you talk about them as if the fiction of the game were true. We are nearing the end of week five of the 2007 oil crisis. People were able to participate in World Without Oil kind of through their favorite communication method. A lot of people blogged, other people made videos, there were a lot of people who just played by email. You could phone in. 
can rebuild the resources we had before, we just can't use oil. And then people also created images or uh, put together image series kind of showing what was going on in a world without oil. I think the players made it a lot more interesting than we ever could. Um, with all the different viewpoints, and you know, some wrote about other lives and really changed it off, and others that have guns and built a wall around their city. I decided to do a comic dealing with the problems and events that arose due to the oil shortage. I just sort of came up with the idea of being able to see it through the eyes of or regular college students that are just trying to get by. ITVS's mission has always been to give unheard people a voice and also to spark public discourse about these subjects and to encourage public debate. And World Without Oil accomplished this in so many ways. It was a project that engaged people from all over the world. It broke down all kinds of borders. We had people who participated from Australia, the UK, Iraq, Japan, from all corners of the globe. People were really dealing with their futures. Um, that's the way they saw it. And they came to the, they brought that sort of earnestness to the game. They were engaged with this as an exercise in imagining a future, you know, playing it so that we don't have to live it. Exclusively, so what we've done is converted most of our backyard and even part of the front yard into food production. So I'm going to take a second to show you that. And so the power of having people live in this alternate reality is that they have to change the way they live their lives. They're not simulating it on in a 3D immersive environment. They're simulating it in their own lives, changing how they commute to work, changing how they prepare dinner, how they go out on dates. And so an alternate reality game, it's not just thinking about change, it's actually making change but in a really fun context where lots of other people around the world are making changes too. The participation with World Without Oil was phenomenal. In just 32 days, we had over 1,500 submissions, and there were 60,000 participants from all over the globe. I think we definitely showed that players will engage with serious issues. People will think about important topics, social topics, political topics, that might not ordinarily engage them, but in the context of a game, they will engage. Games just really have that ability to cut through differences, and we certainly saw that with World Without Oil, and I really hope that other organizations use that ability of um, games to essentially bring people of all different types together in kind of a shared environment, um, thinking about a common future. Um, that's really the potential we were going for um, with World Without Oil. So again, we've, uh, you know, that's from 2007. Um, just notice the typo there. Should be world, not work without oil. Um, even in the 10 years since this game's come out, we can see how, you know, it'd be, it'd be a social media or new sort of online sort of interactivities demanding that type of interaction from people um, and allowing them to kind of interpret things in any number of ways and you know take the awareness that comes with it and be proactive about about the the choices they make in their lives next to uh to real issues so it's quite a um a, a good example of that and just to see how creative a user or player can be in in the face of you know a a set simulator environment with its set amount of problems this one being peak oil um I'm gonna, there's a few examples here of just quite how uh, sophisticated this this sort of the phenomenon of like you, you know crowdsourced games I suppose or you know a purposeful game that's played out online has become mostly in for for research purposes where we've any number of games that have um, come out of universities or 
real research projects where the players are de generating different results that uh, to to what you know normal computer algorithms or computation can can give and actually solving a lot of like outstanding problems and issues in um in medical and biological research so a few of these here we have the eterna project which is uh, related to folding rna mo molecules the quantum moves um where players are move move quantum atoms and this whole idea of reordering um the, the you know the atoms and and uh different molecules um being something that's you know perplexed scientists for for a long time so now they've this crowded source environment where solutions can come up in a game environment like that likewise with iwire which is a game where um mapping 3d new neurons onto a retina or i have a video here for the the folded one which is um yeah, we'll just we'll watch that and we'll see the explanation of that. But, but the bottom line being that these are the, these games, uh, serious games, are actually solving real medical um, problems and coming up with solutions to things which had been lost and it coming from a game play environment or puzzle environment like this. By now, you may have heard of the game called Folded and how its players helped solve the crystal structure of a protein that had remained unsolved for years. The findings were recently described in a prestigious journal and in the proper popular press. Today I'll explain what Foldit is and show you how to get started using it. Foldit is a scientific project aimed at solving the protein folding problem. Predicting the way that proteins fold is a very important problem key to many areas of biology and medicine. Predicting how proteins fold is also computationally very difficult due to the large numbers of possible solutions that need to be tried. Foldit's unique insight is that humans will try solutions that computers may not consider. By creating a game around the protein folding problem, Foldit is able to combine protein folding solutions from human players around the world. When you play Foldit, you're helping to solve an unsolved protein folding problem. Foldit runs on, on a cross-platform client available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. It can be downloaded from the Foldit homepage. After downloading, extract the file if necessary and run the program. The game may need to download some updates at this point. After a few seconds, you'll see the main start screen. Click Start to begin. Now click Create Account, fill in the form, and then click Create. I've already created an account, so I'll just use that information to log in. Foldit begins by giving you a series of training missions to complete. Each training mission begins with some information in a speech bubble. It's helpful to read this information first. My goal on this level is to prevent the two side chains from touching. This is called a clash in Foldit and is represented by the spiky red graphic. I can zoom in or out of the scene with the mouse wheel. I can also rotate the scene by clicking on the background and dragging. After looking at the scene from a few angles, it's clear that I need to move one side chain away from the other. I do this by clicking on it and dragging. The next challenge involves clearing the clash caused by two side chains. One of the powerful things about Folded is its suite of automated tools. This level introduces the shake tool which will rotate side chains around a stationary uh, backbone automatically. When I see that my score, given at the top in blue, is no longer increasing, I press the stop button. That clears, that clears this level. The goal. Okay, so yeah, we, you get the point there. We can just see that this uh, something, it's iterative and everything kind of gets more it leads on to a greater level of complexity um 
with a view to solving outstanding problems in um, in in the worlds of scientific research like this. So fascinating to think that that's where it's up to already, and you know, players and users are contributing to you know. One thing being a learning environment like that, learning about um, how these sort of processes are understood in scientific terms and also contributing to it by by solving a puzzle. Uh, really quickly, I just want to flag this other concept of a serious game being something much more mundane or the potential to just have a different sort of a simulation or a different real world environment. Um, whereby something can be um, resilient and lasting in, in, in terms of time, but not necessarily, you know, solving a puzzle or it not fully understood what it can achieve yet. So this example I just want to give is from an Irish artist called John Gerard. It's oil stick work. Um, and it's basically based around this character here, Angelo Martinez, who is painting his barn. Um, and he's um, he using an oil stick crayon. He works six days a week. Uh, it takes him the whole day from dawn till dusk to complete his action. So the assumption being that he's just going to keep on working at this until he's the entire structure painted, and it'll take 30 years to do that in 2038. And after that, he won't come to work, and uh, the artwork will go on on um display as a finished piece so we see this like really interesting world a digital world essentially where we have this character who um is working every day and kind of occupies a certain different place in your mind when you think of a simulated environment or, or a real character going to work like this so i just wanted to kind of show that you know there's a certain resilience kind of coming across with this of you know, we can only imagine what the technology would be like in 2038 once Angelo Martinez has finished this job and um, how it may go on display or, you know, what sort of energy all this sort of collection of a simulation might have had by then. So um, another side of the mundane really would be looking at, say, big data and data visualization. Again, things which, you know, um, we're only kind of coming to terms with of it, the importance or the physicality of 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 digi digital of digital technologies and digi data files, and how to kind of represent them or what they can do, is you kind of eluding us at the moment, in some degree. So I just want to kind of pull that back in towards like a more serious game or an environment of that, just to kind of show a different example of um how that might come across. We, again, we'll just watch a few minutes of this. I might cut it off a little bit short, but I just want to leave it long enough for you to get the example of this um, interactive VR environment called Death Tolls.
okay, so we can see the, um, you know, the impart of of such a game. It's quite a, you know, um, profound sort of effect that has seen, you know, people taken away from just being a list of numbers and to see that like statist stat based reading of warfare and you know casualties of war kind of visualized like that is um enormously important in 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 you know something that's been missing for quite a long time and just to see that you know you have these sort of really somber and effective environments that a digital serious game environments can 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 position a, a you a viewer in to kind of understand and start to comprehend those sorts of statistics and that data that comes with that um again looking at environmental games this is on the steam account um you're more than welcome to download it's a fantastic game called never alone which is it's kind of one of the there's a few environmental games but i don't think any has been quite as involved as this one and more than being an environmental game i suppose it's more related to um something celebrating um indigenous cultures and really working as a a, do, a, a document and you know I, I suppose something closer to our understanding of what documentary filmmaking might might mean or want to do in a in a game environment like that i have a a short video from the makers of that um where you see it, the, the language in which you're talking about of just building trust and verifying facts with the communities and the people that the game seems to represent all things that you know good documentary filmmaking practice from my own experience would um would entail playing out in a game environment is a really really interesting departure to see that where games might go next along these lines and also just a really stunningly beautiful looking game that they've made with um with a, 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 a beautiful story and characters at the center of it. What we saw out there in video games as far as indigenous representation really felt like appropriation to us. And so we saw this as an opportunity, set the bar really high for other you know, game developers to really bring the community in. I think that's one of the most amazing things about this game is it's not just about bringing stories to the world in a very fun and engaging game, but it's sharing the values and building the game on the value of interdependence, which is at the core of the Alaskan Native values. Um, and it's really a way to take those values and build a really amazing game. And I think one of the things that really became apparent is that as we were developing this game in partnership with Eline is that if you're going to engage in this type of game making you have to have the right partners at the table and I think as a team we probably hit upon quite a few kind of rough patches where we had to figure out okay is it appropriate to change a story in this way or what if we want to portray you know a certain gameplay and if that wasn't okay with elders what were the next steps and so it couldn't be you know a check-in at the beginning and a check-in at the end every step of the way we were calling community members we were engaging them and asking them questions and i think that's what's made this a success and i really think that as we see this medium of games you know kind of world games we're going to see that as the bar that you know game companies have to meet to have inclusive development. Yeah, it, it's interesting. One of the great challenges because the game has to be fun. I mean, none of us will accomplish our goals if this is not a great entertainment experience. And so, a lot of what the team, the collective team, did is look at the themes of interdependence, resiliency, survival, intergenerational dialogue, and say, how does that marry to really good gameplay? The, the team, when, when, when they first came back and suggested a puzzle platform game, it wasn't the obvious choice. You would think maybe an adventure game or something that was a little bit more story driven. But subtly, there's a lot to the puzzle platform genre that works. First of all, it's a beloved genre. So whether you're playing Mario or Limbo, it really works for gamers across generations. And it's, it's a very familiar genre. We're, we're pushing some new areas. So the idea of having a familiar genre is a nice thing. They, platform games tend to have a bit of a linear spine. So the spine of this story of the endless blizzard, we could hang a lot of themes and motifs around. But when you start to unpack it a little deeper, the idea of a two-player cooperative game really is about interdependence. 
And we made Nuna, the girl, and Fox each have capabilities that are different from each other that have to be used in, uh, in tandem to solve these puzzles. So it really is a two-player interdependent cooperative game. But there's also interdependence between the girl, Fox, and nature. We spend a lot of time modeling nature and getting the feel for nature between the real world and the spiritual world. There's a, subtly the themes are instantiated in gameplay throughout, as well as the cultural unlocks, where we shot about 40 hours of footage, distilled it down to 24 mini documentaries that get unlocked the way unlocks happen in a typical game. So yeah, that all kind of you know points back to that original idea we had of just we speak about the complexity of games there. There's that, that kind of speaks to it that the unlock within a game would be a mini documentary about this sort of indigenous tribe and culture and the, the their traditions and their folklore, which is kind of a fascinating way to get an insight into a into in, into the, that, that community or communities in general. Um, Again, that idea, that element of trust, which is, you know, where I kind of pointed out being something which is vital to, you know, good documentary filmmaking practice speaks again to, you know, a convergence with that form that we see this sort of hybrid of a computer game mixed with a documentary, mixed with some sort of archive or, you know, um, an archive of, of this community and how they have and continue to exist and uh, the, obviously then the advocacy side or just the, the kind of the social change aspect of it uh, speaking to how you know uh, in peril aspects of that are be it environmentally or just culturally and um, what what those issues are around the edges of it so it's there, never alone, download it and um, give it to young people to play and play it yourselves because it's a fantastic little game. So, and yeah, who knows where that might go next in terms of indigenous communities and environment and kind of eco issues around that in a game environment like that and a serious game environment like that. Uh, I just want to point quickly towards two new departures with this sort of take on it. The convergence, like I said, just where it's relating to documentary isn't just that one game. The technologies are kind of pulling these two areas closer together. And likewise towards journalism in terms of unpacking more complex issues. So I have two other short videos that I want to show just in relation to um, uh, you know, game, serious game environments being used to kind of expand upon uh, difficulties in journalism and the hacked interactive game about um, Syrian journalism, which broke the same, it, it broke in tandem with, um, you know, the, um, the, 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 the news reportage that was going on around it. And it's somewhat made out of exasperation from the same things by, led by Juliana Rufus with uh, Al Jazeera. Um, who had done a previous one on pirate, pirate fisheries as well of this different type of reportage that can happen there. Um, and then the other one, I'll just play the two of them back to back and then come back to close off. Being a, a, a companion piece to a feature documentary um, on notes on blindness, which again just points to where this technology may lead us. And essentially, I suppose, it, it being a the VR project being a companion piece to a, 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 a cinematic documentary. But um, to my mind, the VR experience probably being something more effective and evocative of the subject matter of the documentary than a, a traditional documentary would. So I'll just show you these two uh, quick promos for these projects and then come back to close off. We are about to ask you to enter a war, a new kind of war where viruses and malware can be just as dangerous as bombs and bullets. Can you put together a case study on the Syrian cyber conflict? You'll get to meet real hackers, courageous activists and rather sharp analysts. They'll tell you how the internet was used to trap and even torture people and to steal sensitive military information that can change the outcome of battles. You have five days. The report must be ready for a global conference where world leaders will discuss banning the export of spying equipment into war zones. 
So join us, but be careful and trust nobody. If you get hacked yourself, you lose. This is facet one, track one, notes on blindness, and this is the 21st of June, 1983. Sitting in the park, children. I hear the footsteps of people walking past me on the footpath. But further out to the right and behind me there's the car park and the sound of people starting and stopping their cars and driving off. Way off to the left there's the main road and the noise of the heavy traffic roaring past in the distance. And the strange thing about it is that it's a world which consists only of activity. In the blind person's appreciation of weather, wind takes the place of sun. So again, just those two examples, I think we'd all agree are quite uh, persuasive in terms of uh, showing other perceptions and other perspectives um, in a quite a dynamic and immersive way that, um, you know, really points to some phenomenal groundbreaking work for serious games. And it looks like it's, you know, something that's, really going to emerge in the next couple of years um, and start solving a lot of using the game environment and the constructs of of game environments to um to solve a lot of problems and different things that um you know humans are and will continue to encounter and experience um yeah i've run over a little bit again apologies about that but uh there's just so much to cram in and there's a lot of really good best practice work here uh, some of the examples that I, I commented on there will be expanded upon in um subsequent lectures so you know if i glossed over something that was taking a particular interest hopefully i catch it again a little bit later but in between if you need any sort of uh any further information on it now please feel free to contact me and i'll send on whatever as i said i'd be great if um you downloaded Never Alone and got playing that because it'll really, you know, um, expand on, you know, the, the sentiments in, in, in this lecture of about serious games and what they can achieve and, you know, being really rewarding environments, um, gaming environments. So next lecture is on impact of games on youth culture. And again, should be more kind of pointed towards the, the, the nature of this course and your own, you know, um, work with young people. So um, 
please feel free to contact me in between if you need any sort of clarification or any info on on what's been discussed so far. Uh, otherwise, I'll uh, see you in the next sector. Okay, bye-bye.